Hello and welcome to our next in the series on the armour of God. We've now reached verse 16 of chapter 6, which says this. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And we're going to be looking at the shield of faith, but I want to look at it in three sections. The first section says, in addition, take it up. What does it mean to take it up in addition to the rest of the armour? We're then going to look at what are the fiery darts that the uh, shield is to protect us from. And thirdly, what actually is faith and how do we use it in our battle? So we begin by asking, what does it mean to say we are to take up the shield of faith in addition my version said, in addition, it can you read in your translation or other translations, it might say, above all, this is something that's very important. Or it could be translated at all times. Because the shield of faith is something that we need to use in the battle. And what Paul is encouraging us here with this word, in, a, in addition, at all times, above all, is to recognize the urgency of the battle that we're in. Because this Roman shield that Paul no doubt was referring to was an oblong which was four, feet, four foot by two foot. It was made of two bits of wood put together with some linen and hide over it with some metal around it. It wasn't the easiest thing to hold, it wasn't the lightest. And you would only take it up when you were actually in the battle. You would only take it up when there was that urgency of being actually in the battle. You wouldn't take it up when you were eating. You wouldn't take it up when you were just chatting with your other Roman soldiers. You would only take it up in the battle. And here we see the urgency and the immediacy of the battle that Paul is talking about. It's likewise Peter also says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 that we're to be alert because we have an enemy who is seeking to devour us. That enemy, the devil, is referred to by Jesus as the prince of the ruler of the air. All around us, the immediacy and the relevance that we are in a battle. And so the first thing Paul is encouraging us again to realise is that we're in a spiritual battle. The Christian life is not a cruise, it's a battle. And we are in the middle of a battle. And we need to be alert, we need to be aware, and so therefore we need to take up the shield of faith so that we are prepared for the battle that we're in. So as we begin, I just want you to reflect on what does it mean to you that we are in a battle, we are in a war. How have you experienced that this week, do you think? How does it make you feel? And how can we be prepared for the battle that we face? So the first thing Paul encourages us to realise that we're in this battle. But what does this battle look like? Well, he goes on to say that the shield of faith is used against, we read, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And certainly the Roman centurion, when he had his shield, partly was there to use against one of the great tactics of firing fire into a troop, into an army. And they would fire it so it would split the army and make them open to attack. So what are the flames? What is the attack of the evil one? If we're in the battle, what is it a battle against? What do we need to be aware of? And here Paul clearly refers to it as the arrows, the flaming arrows of the evil one. So what are these arrows? Now, we clearly see as we look uh, in our Bibles that the way that Satan works is by putting thoughts into our minds, by filling our hearts with desires. We read that. We read that in the lovely story of, uh, well, not the lovely story, the story of Judas. And we read in John chapter, uh, let me find it, John chapter... Uh, 
We see this in Judas. When Judas, we read, was tempted, was prompted by Satan to betray Jesus. Where did it come from? It came from a thought. It came from a decision that was placed in him by Satan. We read it in the unusual story of Ananias and Sapphira in the early church in Acts chapter 5. Uh, we read that Satan, uh, Peter says to Ananias, how has Satan filled your heart? He put a thought, a desire, an idea in the heart of Ananias. Uh, we read it in the Old Testament. We read it in 1 Chronicles 21. We read that Satan incited David to take a census of his fighting men. Where did that come from? It came from Satan. I wonder whether Judas, whether Ananias, and whether David realized that these promptings, these thoughts, these desires, that they realized that they'd come in as flaming arrows. They'd come in from Satan. And that's often the way that we see Satan works. We need to be aware of these thoughts, these promptings, these ideas, and we need to see where they're coming from. Because this is the way that Satan works. And what are some of these things he puts into our hearts and our minds? We know the way Satan works. We know that he accuses us. We know that he tempts us. And we know that he deceives us. And that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 tells us to take every thought captive to Christ. Every thought we need to take control of, to take captive, so it doesn't burst into flames. It doesn't set fire in our lives. We're to take it captive. Because Satan can put thoughts and desires to us. And we need to be aware that that is the battle. And what are those thoughts? They accuse he accuses us. He is the great accuser we read in Revelation. He accuses us before God, but he also accuses us. He accuses us of our past, of things that we've done. He makes us feel ashamed. He accuses us that we're not good enough. He accuses us of our, our shortcomings. He accuses us that we're unlovable, that we're not good enough. He tempts us. He tempts us with our own desires. He tempts us to give in to those things that we know to be wrong and not pleasing to God. He tempts us with something that looks good and that will be pleasing to the flesh and desirable to the eye and, 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 and fulfill a longing within us. He tempts us. But he also deceives us with wrong thoughts about who God is. Wrong thoughts about what God wants of us. We see that in Judas. How did Judas, uh, how did Satan tempt Judas? Perhaps it began with the accusation. The accusation that he wasn't good enough. He wasn't love, loved enough by Jesus. He wasn't liked enough. But he wasn't a Peter or a John. Perhaps Satan accused him, say, you can't be one of the disciples because you just want the money and you just want to use the money. Uh, you're not really there for Jesus. Perhaps he tempted him, tempted him with the money, tempted with the money that he would get, that, that he would be get prominence within the people of God, within the leaders of the people. He would get money for himself that he could use. He saw that he could be successful and make money out of this situation. He was tempted, but he was also deceived. Deceived, perhaps, well, then this Jesus isn't really the Messiah. He isn't really the Savior. So you're not betraying him. You're just so showing who he really is. And so Satan prompted him to betray Jesus. Ananias, perhaps similar, accused him uh, of not being like the other disciples, that you're different. You're not as important. You're not as valued tempted him with the, the money, what he could do with that money if he kept it for himself and deceived him. They won't know. God won't know. Deceived him about the truth of God. And Satan accuses, he tempts, and he 
deceits, with thoughts and promptings that he puts on us. Let's just stop and perhaps share how you've experienced that, perhaps ways that you've experienced that in your life and you've seen that and you can share experiences of, of what the battle is and how you have struggled or how you have overcome in this battle against Satan. So we've looked at the urgency the, to be alert that we're in a battle. We've looked at some of the, the techniques of Satan, of where the battle comes from. But how do we overcome? What is the way to victory? And here is we take up the shield of faith. What is faith? Again, let's just stop and perhaps just take a moment to think, how would you describe faith and how do you use it in our battle? How do you use it to distinguish the uh, attacks of the evil one? When you look at this topic, different commentators will say there are different types of faith. There is the faith of salvation, the faith that we exert when we come to know Jesus and we believe in him and we come to trust him as our Lord and Savior. And as we believe that he died for us and rose again and he is God, we become regenerated, we get newborn, we come to a saving faith. Commentators then talk about a sanctifying faith, a faith that we need to grow in, a faith that grows and enables us to see God sanctify us. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. And it's that faith that, that's grown within us. And then there's supernatural faith, the faith as evidenced by the miracles and the gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit is faith. And that can be helpful. But I also think it can confuse because what is faith? Faith is putting our trust in Jesus, putting our trust in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, putting our trust in the cross of Jesus for our salvation, our sanctification and for the works of God through us. Faith is simply hearing God's word, the word of Jesus, the gospel and believing it and trusting in it, forsaking all, I trust him. The acronym, that's faith. It's trusting Jesus and the work of the cross. And I believe that's what faith is. And I believe that is what enables us to overcome the evil one. That's what John says in 1 John 5 verse 4, I think, that we have overcome uh, the world, even our faith. It's our faith that overcomes our trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross. Because when Jesus died on the cross, what he said on the cross, just before he died, he said these most amazing words, it is finished. God's plan, God's salvation plan, the work of God is finished through his death on the cross. There's nothing else to be done. It is finished. And faith is our faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross that's what faith is and do we believe in what jesus did on the cross is all we need for faith and life that's what faith is and it's something that we need to exercise we're told to take up the shield of faith and that reminds us when jesus says take up your cross daily and follow me Faith is taking up the cross, taking up what Jesus did on the cross and making it our own. Yes, it's taking up the cross, realizing, as Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's what it means to take up our cross. So the shield that we are to take up, can I suggest, is not an oblong. It is a cross shape. Because we're told to take up our cross and follow Jesus. That is faith. So how does that work out as I think of Satan's accusations and his temptations and his deceptions? 
Can I suggest it is that belief in Jesus and his death on the cross that overcomes. It overcomes the accusations because as we, uh, Satan accuses us of the past, we can hold up the cross and say, Jesus' death has forgiven me, has set me free from the past. Therefore, you cannot accuse me of things that I've done in the past. And we can use it for the present when we think that we're not good enough or that we can't do it or that God couldn't love us. We hold up the cross and say, it's not on my benefits because of what Jesus has done for me. It's not my standing. It's not that I'm lovable. It's not that I'm good enough. It's simply on what Jesus has done for me that I stand complete before God, that I boldly approach the throne of God. Therefore, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And I come before God on the basis of Jesus. And I'm loved because of Jesus. And I'm sanctified because of Jesus. And I'm a new creation because of Jesus. And I receive all the promises of God because of Jesus. And then the future. We know our future is secure. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. As Paul says in Romans 8, nothing in all of creation, whether thrones or principalities or powers, the past, the present, the future, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. We are secure as we can ever be. We take up the shield of faith, the cross against the accusations of the evil one. We also take it up against the temptations. The temptations that we are bombarded with and our natural temptations and the temptations that Satan uses. He uses our desires, our sexual desires, our desires for success, our pride, our desires for more, our greed, our selfishness. He takes those and he tempts us. And how do we overcome? We don't overcome by trying harder. We don't overcome by self-discipline. We overcome by the cross of Jesus. Because when we are tempted, we hold up the cross and we say, I've been crucified with Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. Therefore, I put to death, as Paul says, the past and my sinful nature. And I clothe myself with Christ. I claim the cross. My power over temptation is not inward. It's as I look to the cross, as it look to Jesus. And I put my faith in him to overcome. And so I take up my cross daily. I remember against temptation. I don't look inward. I look to Jesus. I fix my eyes on him. I look to the transformation he's made in me. I look to the power that he's given me and set me free to live for him and to follow the leading of his spirit. I take up the cross against the temptations. And how do I overcome the deception? I overcome the deception by claiming simply the gospel is that him, Jesus, crucified. That's what we preach, Christ crucified. It is on Jesus's death that we are forgiven, that we are saved. It is because what Jesus did on the cross that we can stand in Christ, that we can be certain of our future. It's all about him. There's nothing more that's needed. It's only to look to the cross, to look to Jesus, him alone. There's nothing more. It's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus only. And I take up the cross against Satan's deceptions. 1 Timothy 4.1 says uh, about the the teachings. We're not to be deceived by the teachings taught by demons. How do we avoid that? By proclaiming Christ, taking up the cross of Christ and preaching Christ and Christ crucified. It is faith that enables us to overcome faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Are you trusting in that? Trusting in that against the accusations, against the temptations, and against the deceptions. It's coming back to put your faith in Jesus. Perhaps just takes a moment to talk about how practically you do that. What does that look like when you face accusations and temptations? How do we take up our cross daily? How do we remind ourselves of put our faith in Jesus 
for his salvation. Paul says in Colossians, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue in him, strengthened in your faith, in your faith. We need to continue the same way we started, by believing in what Jesus did for us on the cross. It is the power of the cross that alone can overcome the enemy. Talk about your experience of that. Talk about how we can overcome. Talk about how practically, what does it mean to take it up daily? And just reflect on that together. And just before we close, I just want to think of one more thing about the shield. The shield in the Roman army was used more often than not as a group defense. It was called the tortoise maneuver. When the, the soldiers would put uh, the, the shields, they would form a, a sort of square and the, those in front would put the shields in front on either side, they'd put them on the side and behind and those in the middle would lift their shields above them so that they were protected completely by their shields. And can I suggest that if we are to overcome the attacks of the evil one, we need to stand together not stand alone because a shield does not protect us completely if we stand alone but if we stand together stand confident in the faith in our faith in jesus stand alongside one another then we can pre prevent the attacks of the evil one together and that's why it's so important that we meet together it's so important that you're here as part of this life group it's so important that other christians around you that you are part of a church for lots of reasons but here paul says it's the shield of faith and we stand together in declaring our faith and as we declare that together that salvation is through faith in jesus christ as we put our faith and trust in him both for our past present and future we can know victory over the evil one so let's stand together with this shield of faith let's encourage one another in the faith let's encourage one another to use the shield of faith to take up the cross-shaped faith and place it over our lives and we do that by being honest and by sharing with one another we do that by being realistic about the battle that we're all in that we all face and we do that by encouraging one another to overcome by trusting in Jesus. And part of our faith is by praying that for one another, praying in the name of Jesus, praying for oh, victory, resisting the devil because what Jesus has done on the cross and praying for one another. So let's end this session by putting our shields around each other, by sharing where our temptations are, where we're struggling, where we feel the enemy is deceiving us or accusing us or attacking us. And let's together pray in the name of Jesus, put our faith in him that we can overcome together. So just spend time sharing and praying together. God bless you all.